Thank you so much, um, everyone who is joining in. Thank you for taking the poll and thank you for sharing where you're joining from. Uh, we are glad to um, uh, to have this event uh, powered by Jogol Africa on bicep and bicycleity as we are discussing the importance of bicep and bicycleity in life science projects. And um, already in the room, we have all our amazing uh, speakers uh, of today. And I'll quickly uh, take you through uh, their, uh, their bios or introduce them. So uh, this session is going to be um, led by the following people. Uh, Dr. Tokmo Marota, who has already joined in uh, from Africa CDC. Uh, Tessa Alexanian uh, from IGEM Foundation. Sandra Martini from Simbaya Africa. And Dr. Sarah Ware uh, from BioBlaze Community Lab in Chicago, Illinois. Um, so briefly, uh, Tessa, who is going to actually take us through the workshop, because this is uh, going to be both a workshop and a panel discussion. So the first uh, will be Tessa, um, who is going to take us through uh, the workshop um, uh, presentation. And uh, Tessa is, is a safety and security program officer with the IGM Foundation. Um, uh, she, uh, she used to spend her days wrangling robots to do biological engineering, but now spends more time wondering how to get biologists to engineer the right things. So at IGM, uh, she focuses on creating incentives and programs that encourage synthetic biology and development uh, in responsible, responsive, and safe and secure, secure uh, procedures. And she found this by by security group. Uh, thank you so much, Tessa, for joining in. Uh, you can go ahead um, and begin your presentation. Uh, I, I can't hear you, Tessa. Yeah, me neither. Tessa, Tessa can we can't hear you well. You're good now. Okay. Amazing. Um, I was just saying, uh, you know, the way that this talk is going to work is I'm, I'm mostly going to be telling stories about, you know, stories that I have learned that made me feel like biosafety and biosecurity were important. And, you know, I, I want you to please feel free to raise your hand or, or jump in or just, just unmute yourself and say something, you know, if, if there's a point in this talk where you something comes up for you and you're like, oh my gosh, that reminds me of this ridiculous thing that happened in my lab. Like, please, you know, feel free to jump in and maybe during the Q&A session at the end of the talk, if nothing else, we can we can share some stories together. Um, but yeah, just to get started here. Um, hopefully you can all see this. Importance of biosecurity and biosafety and life science projects. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so I guess the first thing I wanted to say is, you know, there are like really quite a lot of resources out there if you want to learn how to how to do your projects in a in a safe and secure way. So a couple of things I've highlighted here is like the the WHO uh, laboratory biosafety manual. They actually just released a new one um, just this year or not this year, just last year. And it's it's like pretty comprehensive. It's pretty good. If you're looking for sort of a, a place to start, they even have, you know, all these supplements with information about how to do risk assessment of your project. So it's it's really it's really quite great. And there's also online, you can find some videos they did in various languages where they're explaining how to use the, um, how to use the manual. There's also a lot of cool online biosecurity resources. I will be linking some of these at the end of the talk. So if you love online tools or online card games or things like that uh you know we'll we'll talk about some of those at the end and then of course like your community is a resource too whether that's the jogal community who are here today or you know laboratory supervisors experienced mentors random people from the internet like me you know if truly if you if you want to talk about safety and biosecurity i cannot promise to be like the most responsive person over email but i definitely don't mind if you email me so you know please feel invited to do that so I, I think given that there are so many resources like this, I, I am not going to spend this talk talking about, you know, 
how to ship your samples safely or um, I'm just going to set a timer so that I don't go way over time so I can talk about this stuff for a long, for a long while. Um, but I, I'm not going to talk about how to ship your and package your samples safely. I'm not going to talk too much about export controls. I'm not going to talk about, you know, what is the difference between a chemical fume hood and a biosafety cabinet. And, and that's because I think, you know, to me, the bigger question is like, you know, why bother? Like, why, why would you go and bother to look up one of those resources that I just mentioned? You know, why, why are biosafety and biosecurity important in the life sciences? And my, my answer to that is that there's a, there's a few categories of things that I tend to worry about, both in my job at iGEM and in general when thinking about the life sciences. So the first one is the sort of, you know, uh, what, what I'd call an accidental exposure. You know, someone from the lab gets hurt. I, I got an email from an iGEM team just yesterday asking if they could work with a toxin. And the very first thing when I Googled that toxin is they were like, ah, oh, yes, this toxin, also known as the very fast death factor. Um, so th that team and I will be having a longer conversation about how they can work with that safely or if they can work with it safely. Because to me, it, it would be, you know, I'm really worried about someone getting hurt in the lab. Um, there's also the case of accidental release. You know, I think this is the thing that a lot of people worry about when they, they worry about synthetic biology is that, for example, we create a gene drive, it gets out into the world and we're not able to control it. Now, in fact, with gene drives, I'm not super concerned about that because they're pretty traceable and they're pretty slow. but you know, this, this concern about accidental release is very real. Um, and then I also worry about what are sometimes called dual use concerns. So this is where you're doing something absolutely intended to have a positive impact, but somehow it ends up helping other people to do harm. And then, you know, lastly, there's this whole big world of kind of unanticipated or unintended consequences. So, you know, maybe it's not that there was an accident, maybe it's not that somebody else was deliberately trying to do harm, but just you're going ahead doing your work and you don't realize that it's going to be harmful, that what you're doing is going to be harmful. So those are kind of, those are my like answers to why bother, but I think just saying that is pretty boring. So I'm going to try to tell a story or two for real stories of th things that have happened that make me feel worried about each of these things and are, are some of the motivations why I feel worried. Um, and again, if you are, if you're here and you want to pipe in as, as I finish telling one of my stories and share one of your own, you know, this, this is a workshop, so please feel invited to. Uh, so starting with accidental exposure, uh, this is going way, well, way back in history in biology years, which means going back to the early 1970s. Uh, I actually think the history of how we ended up with risk groups, which, you know, if you've done a laboratory biosafety training, you've probably heard of risk group one, risk group two, risk group three, risk group four. Where did that come from? Well, 1970 was the first year that anybody created recombinant DNA. And so that's like, you know, DNA that combine, DNA from several organisms artificially combined together. And uh, this, this woman who's pictured on the right here, uh, Janet Metz, she was one of the grad students who was working on that. And um, she and her supervisor, Paul Berg, were working on using SV40, which is a viral vector. And she, in 1972, she goes to Cold Spring Harbor, she's presenting on her work. And just to contextualize the other picture, I wanted to add this in because, you know, the 1970s, again, in biology years are a really long time ago. This is, we don't have PCR, we don't have micropipettes that are any good. You know, most of the, we don't have regular use of restriction enzymes. Like most of the things that you would think about when you think about doing biology in the lab, those techniques are not available to you in, in 1972. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, Janet, she goes and gives a presentation at Cold Spring Harbor and you know, uh, all the students are just milling about, talking about what they're working on, and she kind of casually mentions, oh yeah, we're going to try to use this SV40 virus and put some bacterial DNA into mammalian cells, and people like totally freak out. And you know, one of, one of the other grad students there is like, this is crazy, you definitely can't do that, that's so scary, and ends up getting their supervisor to call Paul Berg, and they have this really, you know, intense conversation where uh, the supervisor's name, I forget his first name, but he was, his last name was Polak, and he's like, you know, you can't go putting these random genes into a virus that, you know, can actually potentially get into, can get into mammalian cells, it's known to infect mammalian cells, this is really dangerous. Um, and it led to this whole uh, brouhaha, I guess, where people were really, really worried about recombinant DNA. You know, this is a paper from 1974, there were all of these huge meetings, uh, including the Asilomar conference, which you might have heard of, where people are, are freaking out about this, and you know, one of the 
one of the solutions they landed on, I guess, was this idea of risk groups where, uh, and I, I think, again, I just think this is an interesting story. Um, at Asilmar, there is, you know, uh, this is a multi-day meeting, there's a lot of debates, and then the final conclusion of the report, which included more or less the definitions of risk groups that we still use today, was more, it was kind of figured out through a, like, working all night to try to come up with some report uh, that people might possibly agree on, and then, you know, there's stories of the organizers wandering around at breakfast at this conference being like, do we have to change any words in this? Are you even willing to sign this? So, uh, again, uh, the history of this stuff is a little bit haphazard, I would say, um, which I, which I find funny. Anyway, so, you know, the way that they decided to define these risk groups and were able to find consensus in that, in that 1975 meeting were on splitting up the risk to the individual and the risk to the community. And I think this gets into the sorts of risks you want to think about when you're thinking about how bad an accidental exposure might be too. So, you know, risk group one, it's like, well, you know, lab strain of E. coli, if you don't swallow it, but you're probably going to be fine, right? Of like a slightly upset stomach or something. Whereas, you know, risk group two, these are things where you, you could actually get sick. Uh, you know, I think um, there are coronaviruses that cause the common cold, for example, that are risk group two, where it's, it's you know, a moderate risk to you, but in, if, if you get sick in the lab and then you go into your community, are you really increasing the amount of risk in your community? No. Um, the risk group three is, you know, this is maybe you're going to have to go to the hospital or be seriously injured, but again, you don't have this huge risk to the community. And then risk group four is where you get into, okay, this is maybe, you know, uh, um, say a respiratory virus that's really severe. And so that would be both a high risk to the individual and a high risk to the community. And when you picture people in those, you know, really intense containment suits that are, uh, you know, sealed with air and uh, they're going through like decontamination chambers before they, they leave the lab. That's that's the kind of thing you, that would be in risk group four. So that's one story, the history of risk groups, talking about, you know, accidental exposure and how people in the early days of our field started to think about what are the risks that you would see from accidental exposure in the lab. Story number two, oops, mailed you a pathogen. Uh, <laughs> so I have a quote here uh, from, a Scientific American article, which uh, describes some some mistakes made by the USCDC uh, in 2014, and this was kind of a this was an embarrassing year for the USCDC in terms of some of these stories coming up. So, you know, there was a mistake in shipping flu virus, uh, and that was just following up on you know this a CDC lab had prepared some samples of anthrax thought it was inactivated, had failed to inactivate it. So, you know, there were people who were following biosafety procedures to handle inactivated uh, anthrax bacteria that instead were handling live anthrax bacteria, worrying. And then also there was apparently just vials of smallpox, you know, one of a, a virus that I'm really glad that humanity has more or less eliminated, just kind of hanging out in a storage room, no locks on the door. Uh, not very well labeled. So this was this is a sort of a pile of things that happened in 2014 that you know caused the CDC to like issue a moratorium for a while on the movement of any biological materials out of any of their biosafety level three or biosafety level four facilities for a while. And it uh, you know I think this is the same period where the CDC ended up uh, instituting a moratorium on gain of function research for a while. So but embarrassing year for the CDC, but. I, I mostly share this because when you're talking about accidental exposure and you're talking about, oh, getting training, you know, the people working at these really high containment US CDC labs are probably some of the most highly trained biologists in dealing with, you know, really intense pathogens and practicing biosafety well. And they are still messing up, right? You're still seeing, oh, whoops, we just left some smallpox around, or yeah, sorry, that, you know. <laughs> Didn't mean to ship you that particular flu. Thought I was shipping you a less dangerous one. I hope you didn't get sick. Uh, so again, the fact that even even these very very highly trained people can make these kinds of mistakes are part of what makes me think that it's important to worry about biosafety and biosecurity because you know clearly we don't have this figured out. Uh, all right, getting into story three. Uh, this is a picture of a cane toad. Two cane toads. Uh, these are one of the worst invasive species in the world. 
I would say in some ways this is not an accidental release because uh, some people in Australia deliberately released cane toads uh, to control pests who are, that were affecting Australian sugarcane crops. Uh, but, you know, it's a really poisonous toad. It now kills Australian pets pretty frequently. It kills native species. I don't think they were adequately anticipating the consequence of their release. So in terms of harm from releasing something you can't control, I would say the cane toad was an example, even though in, in fairness, it was not an accidental release. Another sort of not controlled, but only semi-accidental release, also from Australia. Uh, I just find this article really hilarious. So Australia has had a problem where they brought a bunch of rabbits to the island. Rabbits proliferated like mad, really bad for native species. And there, there was a, a thought that, oh, maybe we can use this virus that infects rabbits, this rabbit hemorrhagic fever, and kind of control the rabbit population by, by killing them with this virus. And so some scientists in 1995 had decided to run an experiment where they were going to, um, you know, there's a little island pretty far off the coast of Australia, and they were going to try to release, intentionally release the virus there and see if it successfully infected and spread amongst the, the rabbit population there and, and reduce the population of that small island. Now, kind of unexpectedly, uh, you know, the disease escaped to the mainland. It's not, still not really sure why. Um, you know, I, I think the one guess is that, you know, bits of the virus got onto uh, some flies that were blown onto the island and then were blown back to Australia. Uh, but I, I sort of share this partly, again, in the kind of confronting the inadequacy of maybe uh, the way things currently work to, to deal with these problems. I, I find this quote really funny of the scientists responsible are choosing to see the escape in a more positive light. So at this point, you know, thousands of rabbits have, di have died in, in Australia from this, this fly that gets blown over. Well, this spreads extremely good news. It demonstrates the virus will do what we want it to do in Australia, kill rabbits. And, uh, and this quote is from pretty soon after the, the virus got onto Australia and it ended up killing, uh, if I'm remembering the numbers right, tens of thousands of rabbits, might, might have been even more. It was, it was a lot more than the scientists were bargaining on. So this is kind of, to me, a, a quite funny quote because it's early in the escape and they're like, oh, yes, it's, it's basically extremely good news. And then later on, it was, I think, again, quite a bit of an embarrassment for, for the field and, and a, a bit of a wake-up call for how well can we, how, how well are we able to predict how our field trials will go and, and, you know, what is the likelihood of accidental release from that sort of thing? Okay, uh, another story. Um, actually, I'm going to pause here. Does anyone else have stories they want to share about accidental exposure or accidental release before I jump into dual use? Doesn't have to be from your personal life either. I mean, none of these are from my personal life. I just think they're uh, kind of dramatic. Not hearing anything, so I'm going to jump on to talking about dual use. Uh, so again, this is this is the sort of harm that happens where you're intending to do something positive, but maybe there's a risk that somebody else takes what you were doing and ends up doing harm with it. And so uh, one story here, this is a uh, project that came out of the DARPA agency it, in the US. And they were interested in engineering insects to deliver uh, CRISPR payload to, so in the case, the, the idea of the pro program was, oh, maybe there's, you know, either deliberately or not deliberately, a really serious crop pathogen that's spreading. And, and CRISPR editing the crop would be able to defend it against that pathogen. But, you know, if you just edit the plants in the lab and then release the next season, maybe that's not fast enough. And that's a really serious crop pathogen. So maybe instead you can use insects to deliver the CRISPR uh, payload to crops that are, you know, already out in the field. Now, uh, a lot of people responded to this saying, hey, hey, wait a minute, you know, do you have any guarantee that these payloads of CRISPR that you're, you're claiming will be used to protect against pathogens, is there any reason that the system you're designing couldn't also be used to carry pathogens or to otherwise damage crops? You know, so again, that's that kind of dual use of you've built this general purpose system. Doesn't it seem like it could also enable misuse? And uh, I would say this was a, a globally fairly controversial program, and there were accusations that this was in violation of the Biological Weapons Convention. So uh, that's, you know, um, you maybe you made a bioweapon there. Story number five. This is a super recent story. 
Um, and I brought it up partly to talk about how it's not only, you know, pathogens or sort of immediately physically dangerous stuff, uh, or even, you know, CRISPR insects that present dual use concerns, but even, even software can. And so this is, this is from March this year, and there was a, a company doing drug discovery and they were, um, they were developing an algorithm to predict whether, uh, whether a compound would be toxic. And so this is useful because maybe if you screen toxic, if you screen chemicals using this algorithm ahead of time, you know, then that will uh, prevent you from having chemicals that fit, fail your phase one or phase two clinical trials because, because of toxic, toxicity. Or, you know, maybe you can skip some, or speed up your animal testing because again, you're, you're gonna bring fewer uh, potentially toxic chemicals to that, to that stage. And so the, the creators of this algorithm were at a meeting about, you know, security and artificial intelligence and, and biochemical weapons. And so people were like, hey, if your algorithm is really good at predicting what chemicals are toxic, does that mean that, you know, if you run it in a generative way, is it able to generate new toxic compounds that just score really highly in, in this algorithm you've built? Um, and so this is the quote from them. They were like, oh, we didn't, that thought had never struck us. We were vaguely aware of security concerns around work with pathogens or toxic chemicals. Didn't relate to us though. We primarily operate in a virtual setting. Um, and so they, they built a model. And I'm, I'm quoting again from this paper. In less than six hours after starting our in-house server, our model generated 40,000 molecules. Um, in the process, the AI designed not only BX, which is a, a serious chemical warfare agent, but many other chemical warfare agents. It also designed many new molecules that looked equally plausible. These new molecules were predicted to be more toxic than publicly known chemical warfare agents. So again, this is kind of, oh, we're, we're just trying to figure out, you know, if these, we're just trying to figure out, figure out how to speed up drug discovery and, you know, design really safe um, therapeutics. But it turns out this thing that we built could be repurposed to potentially design chemical warfare agents. So that's, that's that story, very recent story that I, I think is pretty interesting. Um, now getting to unanticipated harm, you know, the, a lot of the history of biomedical science is, is pretty ugly. Um, I'm, I'm mostly familiar with examples from North America. So th this is an example from the US. Uh, so in the US, there was a 40 year uh, study called the Tuskegee syphilis study, um, where doctors deliberately concealed diagnoses from syphilis positive participants and prevented them from seeking treatment. Uh, and so there's no way for these participants to make an informed choice. And, and some of them got sick and, and probably died prematurely because of this study. Um, and you know, not just to call it the US, uh, my own country, Canada, uh, did, I think, pretty similarly heinous experiments where they were uh, working with uh, malnourished indigenous children and, you know, split them into a, uh, you know, split them into, into control groups, which means that there were, you know, malnourished children who were being, like, deliberately denied adequate nutrition, which I think is pretty despicable. And I, I guess the reason that I bring this up is because, you know, this isn't that long ago, Tuskegee syphilis study, so you can see this memorandum ended in 1972. And yet, and I imagine that these biomedical scientists thought that what they were doing was a good idea. You know, I, I suspect that they had had thought about this at least a little bit and, and thought that the, the scientific work that they were doing was positive. But, you know, from my vantage point, 50 years later, I mean, this is insanely unethical like how how dare you right um and so you know i also bring this up just to be like you know there, there's a lot of history in our field of, of people thinking that their actions were justified and they weren't and so it's also worth reflecting in a broader way about whether we can you know shorten the time it takes to realize that we've made bad judgments about about the potential harm of our work um Okay, so this is back on our why bother. So told you some stories about each of these different areas of, you know, accidental exposure where somebody in the lab might get hurt, you know, maybe because you accidentally shipped live antivirus around when it was supposed to be inactivated, accidental release, this is how you get poisonous toads, uh, dual use, this can show up even with software, and unanticipated or unintended consequences. So failing to realize that the work that you're doing is going to do harm. 
what can you do next? Well, uh, these are these are the resources that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, and you know, truly there are a huge number of educational resources on the internet, and I will um, now put a large number of links into the chat. So if this is the kind of thing that you are now feeling fired up about, so many resources. Um, but I also want to be clear that it's not just about learning. You know, there's a lot of like interesting problems to be solved in this. So I, I think there's some engineering problems in biosecurity and biosafety that I'd love people to be working on, you know, whether that's developing countermeasures. So there's things like if you identify a software vulnerability, can you, now that you've identified it, can you work around it and prevent your software from being misused in that way? Or if you've, you know, realized a, I don't know, a, a, if you've found a like novel antimicro antimicrobial resistance factor, is there you know, should you conceal that knowledge? Should you uh, figure out some way to get around it? You know, I, I think that's that's pretty worth doing or worth, worth thinking about. Um, you know, I'd also like to see people working on safer alternatives for common methods. So we've had some iGEM teams in the past, for example, uh, working on selectable markers that don't use antibiotic resistance factors. And then I also think getting into that uh, accidental release world, I think getting better biocontainment systems, you know, I know, Again, lots of iGEM teams have worked on things like kill switches or even physical biocontainment like uh, hydrogels. But I, I think one thing that I would love to see more of is really rigorously and empirically characterizing how well those systems work and comparing them in that way. Or similarly, you know, there's been a ton of interesting work in gene drives about making mathematical models of how they would spread in a real environment and then, you know, using those to uh, reinforcing those models with large cage trials, for example, with mosquitoes. So I, I, I think that that kind of engineering work is really important. I think again, unanticipated harms and, and really across all of these areas, you know, putting a bit of time into trying to anticipate impacts of your work can be really important, whether that's, you know, actually going out and speaking to the people who might be affected by it, this kind of stakeholder engagement or human practices that we try to encourage in iGEM, or, or sitting down and doing a more detailed risk assessment. And, you know, I, I linked a couple of tools that are meant to help with that in the chat. Um, and then lastly, you know, I think there's also just, you know, I feel like biosafety and biosecurity, and, and the reason I talk more about, about stories than, you know, here's the checklist of things you must do, is that I think compliance is kind of the wrong mindset to be in around all this. You know, I, I would rather us be a field where we're kind of providing each other with mutual accountability and support to, to do good in our work, not just checking off boxes of like, okay, yes, I completed this training, done. Uh, so, so that's my answer on what you can do. And in conclusion to this brief, somewhat workshoppy talk, you know, I, I hope you now have some answers to why are biosafety and biosecurity important in the life sciences, and I will happily take questions. Wow, thank you so much, Tessa. Wow, that was really a, a good overview uh, on biosafety and biosecurity from the different scenarios, um, and I hope um, the attendees were able to uh, learn a few things. Um, so this is um, uh, this is there's in the next few mi minutes, probably three or five, we'll have a um, a session of questions and answers. Uh, you can type in your questions in the chat uh, about this session by Tessa, uh, or you can raise your hand up virtually and i be able to pick you up and you can ask. Or you can also share an experience as Tessa has had said uh, during the presentation, if you have an awesome um, experience about uh, this topic, according to uh, Tessa's um, shared experiences, you can go ahead and, um, and share it. Uh, so uh, go ahead and um, uh, uh, type in your question in the chat uh, or raise your hand and we can be able to pick you up. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tessa. Um, it was really, really a, a great presentation and it was more elaborate uh, from uh, experiences perspective and I myself learned um, a few things that I did not know about that topic. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. Um, as questions come in, uh, the next session is going to be a panel discussion and uh, it's going to be led by Eric, uh, Eric and Baluku. 
and uh, we have three uh, great experienced um, personnel to take us through this uh, panel uh, discussion. And um, shortly, you can be able to uh, uh, share their bio before they begin after the Q&A session. Um, so in the chat, uh, someone is asking about if you can share more about how IGM approaches biosafety and biosecurity. Go ahead, uh, Tessa. Sure, Over. yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, I guess I'd say one, one big lesson that, I'll, I'll say a few things. One is that iGEM's biosafety and biosecurity program has evolved over many years. And I think while kind of in taking, taking our responsibility as, as a, a place that a lot of people have their first experiences with, you know, we try to take seriously our responsibility as a place where a lot of people around the world had their first experience of synthetic biology and, and their first, uh, you know, find their footing as members of the synthetic biology community. And so, you know, I, I think thinking about the anticipating the impacts of our work and thinking about uh, biosafety and biosecurity has been part of iGEM for a long time. But uh, early on, I think there were a couple of what I would maybe call near misses that sort of spooked iGEM and led to the introduction of a more rigorous project screening process. So I, I think the, the place that we've ended up is saying, we're going to make a list of kinds of work that we don't think present any elevated risk. And so this is what we call our white list. And I, I can uh, link that in, in the chat as well, in case you find it a useful resource. But, you know, these are things like lab strains of E. coli, you know, uh, guide RNAs that don't target human genes, where we go, okay, you know, this should be no riskier than any other thing that you would do in, in a biology laboratory. And then, you know, we have some things that we call it specifically uh, as not on the white list. And those are things that we think present an elevated risk. And before teams work with them, we ask them to first describe their plans to us. And we have a, a community of experts called the Safety and Security Committee. Um, and we, we, uh, we get support from that committee in my videos. I cut out weird. Um, we, we get support from that committee in, uh, in responding to and, and evaluating the plans of those, of those students. So for example, at the very start of this, I talked about a team that wants to work with a toxin. We're going to ask them to describe in detail the laboratory protocols that they'll use to work with that toxin, and then we'll run their plan past this, this group of experts. Um, and, and again, I guess the other thing I would say is that's, that's kind of how we do the project screening. The other thing I'd say about our approach is that you know, it's it's very important to me that biosafety and biosecurity not just be about not doing things, but that they also be about kind of proactively taking actions. And, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer by training, so I love all this applied kind of technical progress in biosafety and biosecurity type stuff. So I, I'd say that's part of our approach as well. Thank you, um, Tessa. Um, the other question is from uh, Jagello, uh, who says, kindly comment on biosecurity in light of pandemic preparedness and response, especially in the field space? Yeah, so I, I do think, you know, one, one thing that I know has come up in, in pandemics and, and sort of challenges for biosecurity in light of pandemic response is around sample management. So as, uh, as Sarah ch shared in the chat, you know, the WHO definition of laboratory biosecurity is kind of protection, control, and accountability for biological materials within laboratories. And so things like the vials of smallpox sitting around in the CDC in an unlocked room is like poor biosecurity. And, and I think that's one of the places where uh, biose biosecurity ar concerns arise as people are responding in the field to a pandemic is, uh, is around uh, issues of sort of sample management and potential, you know, reinfection and how to adequately protect healthcare workers as they're going into, into a, a space. I think then there's also a lot of pandemic, you know, less in the response space, but more in preparedness and prevention, whether that's, you know, managing the risks that we accidentally cause a pa pandemic um, or even an outbreak through those ideas of laboratory and 
acquired infections. You know, there's there's an example of an outbreak that um, we're pretty sure in the 1970s that we're pretty sure happened because of a air filter in a high containment lab that was being changed out. And then there was a shift change of the lab supervisor and they weren't informed that this air filter uh, was still not operational. And so a lot of, uh, if I'm remembering right, this was anthrax spores, a lot of anthrax spores from a, a Russian bioweapons lab got out into the neighboring village and sickened a lot of people. So, you know, the, this kind of laboratory biosafety and biosecurity shows up as well in, in preventing uh, accidental release and exposure, which, which could potentially cause pandemics. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sarah, for sharing um, in the chat the uh, resources and uh, Geoffrey. Thank you so much. The last one here is from Elkana, uh, who says, thank you, Tessa, for presentation. Every day I find myself thinking a lot in dual use, uh, especially with the movement of therapeutics in healthcare. Does IGM engage clinicians in certain training programs? Yeah, I, I think you're right that therapeutic development is uh, is a place where there's the potential to generate a lot of dual use knowledge. You know, I, I know, for example, there's there's a really interesting paper comparing different approaches to platform vaccine design and kind of concluding that RNA-based vaccines pose lower dual use concerns than virally vectored vaccines. For example, because, you know, viral vector vaccines, the development of those will also generate knowledge about how to evade the human immune system. And, you know, that could, that knowledge could potentially be repurposed and misused. So, you know, I agree that that's like a really rich and, and interesting area to, to consider dual use in. Um, does IGEM engage clinicians in certain training programs? Not really, other than through our engagements with the IGEM community, which includes some early career clinicians. Um, you know, I, I think we we stand ready to collaborate with uh, with folks who are doing clinical training, but it's it's definitely not one of our focuses. Thank you so much, uh, Tessa, uh, for answering the questions. So, um, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll go ahead. Um, Okay, uh, Alonso is having his hand up. Alonso, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So uh, on January 2022 this year, uh, I saw that I did publish an article about uh, how the use of gene drives technology surprised him. I think it was during 2017 competition. It was really, really cool to hear about that or to read about the experience you had uh, on how it was surprising to, to see a team, a student's team using this kind of technology. Uh, so I wanted to explore a little bit about the, the things like the activities or the discussion you held within the security and safety and security company in order to keep up to date uh, into the new technologies and like to be at least prepared uh, for certain outcomes that could come from the use of certain technology. Yeah, when, so I'll say two things. One is that we do host an annual meeting where we try to get all the members of the safety and security committee together and basically invite everyone to give super short presentations on, give us five minutes, you know, what are you thinking about these days? What does IGEM need to keep an eye on? Uh, so that's, that's, you know, one way that we do, I guess, a little bit of horizon scanning of what might be out on the horizon that we're going to have to manage. The other thing I'd say is I often describe screening projects for IGEM as getting to do a global horizon scanning, horizon scan in synthetic biology pretty much every year. And you know, one of the big lessons we learned from that gene drive case study and, and from other near misses is that the earlier we can talk to students about their projects, the better. And so, you know, now we have a safety form deadline that happened where we get every team within iGEM to submit a, a basically a risk assessment to describing their project and potential risks and how they're managing them. And we, we get a form from them at the end of June as well as at the end of the competition. And that's so that we can hopefully you know, if the team is doing something that would really raise a lot of concerns and we want to be really engaged with them, we can find out sooner. And I, we're trying to push that even earlier by also hosting these interactive workshops with teams and sort of saying, hey, if you're hitting any of these concerns, please come talk to us. We would love, we would love to chat. Uh, so I think that's one thing is trying to find out about projects like earlier and earlier in the project cycle and then doing this kind of uh, shared horizon screen. Uh, the, those I feel like the main ways we try to keep up with things and, and just, you know, reading papers as they come out. Great. Thank you so much, Tessa. Um, thank you everyone who has uh, been able to uh, participate in this Q&A session. Um, thank you so much, Tessa, for a great presentation, giving us an overview 
of biosafety and biosecurity and um, uh, we are more glad to have uh, shared this experience from you so uh, right about now uh, we are going to continue um, going to our panel discussion and um, it's going to be moderated by um, Eric and Baluku um, and it's going to have three members and we'll be talking about implementation of biosafety and biosecurity in Africa so the key panelists are um, Dr. Tokmo Marota uh, from Africa CDC. Um, I will not really um, um, spend really more time uh, talking about Dr. Tokmo. Uh, here is uh, his quick bio. Um, he's a public health medical laboratory scientist and uh, he's really, really has been working uh, uh, in the field of, of biosafety and biosecurity for a long period of time. Um, we have uh, Sandra Martini uh, from Simbaya Africa, uh, who is an immunologist and microbiologist and has a lot of experience in project planning uh, management and also a lot of experience from community-based initiatives in biosafety and biosecurity. Uh, she will be uh, joined uh, by Dr. Sarah Ware uh, from BioBlaze Community BioLab, uh, which is in Chicago, Illinois. This is a community lab. Uh, Sarah will, will be sharing um, her story about how everything is going at the community BioLab level. Uh, so we can't wait to listen from these amazing experiences from the three panelists. And feel free to uh, have um, also uh, kind of interaction from the chat as we are listening from them. Over to you, Eric. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Alex. Uh, <coughs> thank you, the speaker, Tessa, and all the speakers that are going to participate in the panel discussion. And also uh, the scientists that have taken their time to come and attend uh, this workshop on biosafety and by security. So uh, at this moment, we are going to have our panel with uh, so interesting and delightful speakers that have been selected to come and give an overview about by safety uh, and by security. And uh, to start this, uh, as we have our three uh, our panelists, Sarah, Sandra, and Dr. Tokmo, we're going to basically, as we introduce ourselves, uh, we're going to talk about briefly how does our work uh, connect to biosafety and biosecurity. Like I believe uh, Sarah from BioBlaze uh, Community Lab, Sandra from Simbai Africa, and Dr. Tokmo from Africa CDC, we've been working in this field for some good time. So we'd like to see how do your work uh, connect with by safety and by security so that the audience can get more enlightened of how what you're doing interferes with uh, uh, by safety and by security. So starting with uh, uh, Sarah from BioBlaze uh, Community Lab, uh, you can go ahead to tell us how the amazing work that is being done in the lab, how it connects with by safety and by security. Hi, sure. Um, we're really honored to have been asked to be on this panel with these really amazing experts, um, be connected with all of you. Um, so I'm coming from the community biolab perspective. Um, I have had a foot or have a foot in basically three worlds. Um, I've worked in um, private industry in R&D. I teach university biology classes, so I, I teach biosafety in the labs there, but I'm coming now from perspective of having a biohacking space or a community biology space in the Chicago area. Um, so there are some resources already. I just wanted to, I, I first just wanted to point out, I, I think it's really interesting that everyone in the poll said that they were at least familiar with biosafety and biosecurity. And, and I wonder what does that mean? What can that tell us? Um, we don't know, <laughs> it's just a simple poll, but I think the results were interesting. Why aren't people attending this workshop who have little understanding 
of biosafety and biosecurity, but okay. Um, we already in the community setting, we have some resources. And so um, it's kind of in general thought that community biology, we don't think about biosafety and biosecurity, but um, a lot of us do. <laughs> And so there are um, at least three resources, major resources that have come about that I'll just mention and then I'll, I'll turn it over to other speakers and maybe talk about other things later. But um, one of them is the Community Biology Biosafety Handbook. And that was spearheaded by Todd Koken and Dan Grushkin and some others and funded by Open Philanthropy. So this handbook is, um, was created after they were visiting, I think about 20 different community labs throughout the world. And mine was one of them. And, um, and it's, it's really tricky for community biology because um, <clears throat> you have to mitigate risk based on what kind of resources are in each lab and they're not standardized. Um, anyway, so there's that. And then Jogel, has a biosafety and biosecurity guidelines. And that was really, the basis for that was this um, document that I just mentioned, but it was elaborated upon. And then there's also a collaborative effort going on right now with Jogel and iGEM on biosafety and biosecurity that Tessa is also involved in that I can talk about further later. But thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I think that has been uh, that has been a good uh, highlight about uh, the different resources and uh, projects that, uh, from the perspective of the community lab, how you're trying to bring all this together to make sure people are enlightened more about uh, the biosafety and biosecurity. So, talking from uh, uh, the perspective now of an organization like by Africa, say Sanfra, can you go ahead maybe to tell us more about uh, as you're trying to cut out much work in this field that is new and I know people are trying to explore what is being done in synthetic biology. How do you think uh, also this part is more linked and uh, important in, in biosafety and biosecurity? Uh, thank you so much, Erica, and uh, hello everyone who is on the call. Uh, my name is Sandra Martini. And I am the chairperson executive board of uh, Africa. I'm really so delighted to be with us here uh, tonight. So you're logged in from. Um, so from the perspective of uh, Sinbio Africa, we are Sinbio Africa. We bring together a number of stakeholders in from different uh, uh, from different fields, including uh, academia, uh, the policymakers, and so many other uh, fields of people to be able to champion uh, synthetic biology on the continent. And for that, uh, we, we get to uh, get involved in a number of, uh, in a number of uh, projects, synthetic biology being a new field that we have on the continent and the kind of advanced uh, technologies that it's um, that it employs we have teams that are carrying out projects that could actually turn out to be um, a danger to either the people who are carrying out these projects or even um, any accidental release of uh, the products from these uh, laboratories to the to the communities and so we we, 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 we are in a place whereby as we go ahead to champion the implementation of uh, synthetic biology on the continent, we are very cognizant of what role we have to play um, as stakeholders in this, in this area to ensure that we, you know, we don't, the projects that we are pushing so much to have implemented do not turn out to be um, a cause of, you know, big problems. We, we have um, had the experience of uh, what the pandemic has done. And with advancement in technology, with advancement in synthetic biology, we could have much more bigger challenges than even the pandemic that we've experienced. And uh, currently at, Sin, at Sinbio Africa, we are implementing uh, um, a project 
um, on uh, global catastrophic biological risks. And this is looking at the bigger picture of what could go wrong if um, uh, we have maybe misuse of, uh, misuse of uh, some of the uh, biological materials from the labs that we are, you know, that the, the, the different synthetic biology initiatives are, are carrying out. And so we, we, we have some kind of such initiatives like the GCBR initiative that I've just talked about to see that we push, we, 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 we can be able to create awareness um, on how we can have the projects implemented, but also ensure there's a safety for everyone. And um, for that, I'm, I'm really so grateful that uh, we were invited on this, uh, on this particular panel and we'll be discussing more on how our work uh, relates to biosafety and biosecurity. Thank you so much and back to you, Eric Han. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sandra, for that uh, good highlight. I know uh, as Africa, as a continent, uh, much work is also being done uh, in many fields and one of the fields is synthetic biology being a new field and we are trying to see people trying to also work on the biosafety and biosecurity. This becomes so important that uh, that aspect is put into context and I've got a good highlight from Sandra how projects are now being run in Africa and this big project coming in to assess risks and to maybe prepare life scientists in Africa about how they can be ready to handle such uh, hazardous materials and, and control any kind of safety concern that that's that's re that's really very very uh, good initiative. So we'd like to switch uh, to Dr. Tokmo, who uh, is from Africa CDC. I believe uh, much work uh, has been done by Africa CDC. And uh, recently, uh, there was a launch of uh, a training that is going to be happening. So I think uh, Dr. Tokmo is going to enlighten us much more about uh, like the, reg the regulations uh, that have been put in place about how Africa CDC has extended by safety and by security within the African continent. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Tokmo to give us more highlight on this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to appreciate um, um, inviting Africa CDC to be part of this uh, very important discussion. Um, so very briefly, um, um, is already indicated, uh, I work for the Africa Centers for Disease Control, and uh, I coordinate the implementation of their biosafety and biosecurity initiative in the Africa region. And um, this initiative is born or was born uh, out of uh, the observed or uh, well-known capacity gaps among African Union member states when it comes to uh, biosafety and biosecurity. One just has to look at um, some of the well-known uh, measurement matrices in the world. If you look at the WHO joint external evaluations conducted um, between um, uh, 2016 and 2019 in the Africa region among 42 uh, countries, you would see that um, the average performance of the uh, 42 member states who participated in biosafety is only about 32%. When you also look at um, the recent uh, publication by the Global Health Security Index, which also is a uh, measurement matrix for uh, several core capacities when it comes to preparedness and response. When you look at the aspects of uh, biosecurity, none of the African member states scored beyond 30%. So because of these known capacity gaps, Africa CDC, together with its regional, international, as well as our member states, came together to launch the Biosafety and Biosecurity Initiative uh, in 2019. And uh, the main goal of this initiative is really to uh, build the capacity of the African Union member states such that they can be able to comply with many of the international requirements for biosafety and biosecurity, including your international health regulations for 2005, uh, the Biological Weapons Convention, United Nations Security Council Resolution, uh, especially Resolution 1540, as well as the multi-country global health security um, agenda. So we have been uh, implementing this initiative um, since 2019. And uh, as already indicated by the uh, program director, there are a number of initiatives uh, that um, we are working on and some of them are already realizing some uh, outcomes, which uh, we can discuss uh, as we proceed in the, in the discussion. 
Uh, so briefly, this is our, our involvement in strengthening biosafety and biosecurity in the Africa region. Over. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Maruta. If we could just continue uh, from where you uh, have stopped. As a person who has gone through a kind of initi an initiative to bring this training and all the work that has been previously done by Africa CDC, uh, how do you think... Uh, how, what do you think could be the best way to uh, engage or more evolve? Uh, uh, I can say at the level of Africa, the more the organizations that are trying to come up or the industry that are taking up the work in the field of, of, of life sciences, uh, how do you think we could more engage them to make sure they take up uh, trainings and make sure they are well equipped in this field of biosafety and biosecurity from the African context? Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, uh, as Africa CDC, we are a technical agent of the Africa Union, and uh, our role in the continent is to uh, work with member states, work with many different partners, uh, engage them, and uh, ensure that we assist member states to strengthen their uh, uh, health systems to ensure that they are able to uh, respond uh, or prepare to any um, um, unintended emergencies, including public health uh, emergencies. So uh, as a regional institution, our role is really to ensure that um, we come up with the necessary uh, policies and guidelines. We also ensure that uh, we provide the necessary guidance. We also ensure that we provide um, and ensure that there is necessary legal um, uh, environment to allow uh, the implementation uh, of um, um, capacity building initiatives in biosafety and biosecurity. So as I speak about that, I would like to share with you some of the key, um, 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 key initiatives that we have been implementing in the region to try and create that environment that ensure that we all work together um, to achieve uh, the, the required capacities in biosafety and biosecurity. Firstly, uh, Africa CDC, together with member states, Conduct, conducted an extensive consultative process uh, between 2019 and 20, 2021. This consultative process engaged member states uh, through the five regions of Africa to identify the actual capacity gaps that they were facing and challenges that they were facing on the ground. And based on that, we produced um, a regional priorities report which is a summary of the actual capacity gaps that member states were facing and struggling with. And based on that, uh, we were then able to develop our interventions to support them. Secondly, uh, we have also um, uh, come up with the biosafety and biosecurity five-year strategic plan. So this strategic plan is a central point that all development partners in the region, all organizations and institutions that seek to assist Africa Union member uh, states can come together at a central point where we have come up with um, uh, interventions that are, that are based on the priorities that member states have indicated. So this five-year strategic plan seek to ensure that there is a coordinated approach when it comes to strengthening biosafety and biosecurity in the region. This uh, strategic plan is available publicly online. If you Google on, uh, go to Google and search Africa CDC Biosafety and Biosecurity five-year strategic plan, you will be able to uh, access it. So uh, it, it is a document that allows us as the, as the region to say, if you want to come and assist us, if you want to come and help us to strengthen the capacity in the region, these are the areas that the member states have prioritized for us to work from a regional perspective. Now, this five-year strategic plan has got uh, several priority areas. Uh, one of which is uh, working with member states to create um, a biosafety and biosecurity legislative framework. One of the bottlenecks in the region is that we do not have appropriate um, uh, legislative or legislation that specifically speaks to biosafety and biosecurity in its entire scope. As a result, some of the things that we are discussing here, whether it's science, uh, dual use research, uh, uh, pathogen uh, economics, we do not have appropriate legislation in member states to support and ensure that this is done in a safe and secure manner. So we are working to develop a regional uh, legislative framework that member states can then domesticate uh, and implement at a national level. This document is already being discussed and reviewed at the African Union level. Secondly, um, 
as you have mentioned, we have come up with a regional training and certification program for biosafety and biosecurity professionals in the region. This uh, 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 training program ensures that biosafety and biosecurity becomes a professionally recognized discipline in the region. One can then aspire to pursue biosafety and biosecurity at that level in the same way that you become a pediatrician, in the same way you become a midwife, in the same way you become a medical laboratory scientist. So this uh, training program, we launched it uh, just last month in April. Now, what does it uh, do? It has got four areas of specialization. You can specialize in bio-risk management. You can specialize in maintenance, certification and installation of biological safety cabinets. You can specialize in uh, management of bio-containment facilities. So these are your BSO3 labs, your bio-repositories. And then lastly, you can specialize in biological waste management. So uh, we have started with these four, but we'll be expanding the school as we move forward. Other third priority area that we are working on to strengthen biosafety and biosecurity in the region is uh, coming up with a regulatory and certification framework for high containment facilities. It is unfortunate that at this time point in the region, we do not have agreed upon, regionally agreed upon minimum standards for biosafety and biosecurity for these high containment facilities. Therefore, this regulated framework seeks to ensure that we establish and uh, uh, agreed upon minimum standards for biosafety and biosecurity at the regional level. The framework will also have an evaluation tool, which member states can use to evaluate compliance for those institutions that are handling high-risk pathogens. And the third component, we have a certification uh, framework. So these are some of the areas where we are trying to bring together many partners, many players, um, uh, development uh, partners, uh, donors, so that we can all work from a centralized point to, to strengthen and build structures and systems, especially at a regional level, which can then be cascaded at national level to strengthen uh, biosafety and biosecurity. Uh, let me pause here uh, and, and um, um, uh, hand it back over to you, the moderator. Thank you. Okay, thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Tokmo, uh, for that insightful information about uh, the different strategies uh, that have been put in place by Africa CDC to make sure uh, the life scientists that are working in this space uh, are, can access information and can have a structure to follow uh, in this area of biceps and biosecurity. Now switching to Sarah, Sarah has been having an experience in starting a community lab. Uh, Sarah, from your perspective and your experience as a person who has uh, gone through this journey of starting a community lab, uh, what do you think could be one of the uh, strategies that we could uh, look at in the whole process of coming up with the community lab, sharing your own experience to make sure we have a lab that is at standard in both uh, the in both the lab space and and what it does in the lab, but also putting in the aspect of by safety and by security so that this lab cannot be able to harm both the people in the lab and the environment. Hi. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there are, like Tessa was saying in her talk, there are already a lot of resources um, available for um, safety, but for the community lab, we, we are adapting some new documents and some new biosafety and biosecurity programs so that we're tailoring more to the community biology settings. Um, which are not really the same as, usually are not the same as um, a setting at um, a, a company, for example. You know, we're talking about people having labs in their homes or out in um, places where the community can come and use the equipment and things like that, which is a totally different environment for um, lab safety. Um, I, I could talk some about what iGEM and Jogal are doing right now that I had mentioned. So we are really the challenge. I was trying to, to convey what is really our challenge and why are we doing this? And one of those challenges is we wanna know how to educate independent researchers about biosafety and biosecurity in a way that's seen as beneficial and not judgmental and chastising in a way that is helpful and in a, in a way that people will want to adopt these practices. And so we've really been working hard to 
um, to create something that is educational um, for the community and something that is is viewed as a partnership more than um, you know this is what you have to do so in this community with um, in, in general there are a lot of really independent thinkers and there's also this um, you know we don't things that we do in community biology don't really fall under the regulations of you know like the FDA or, or some of these other other regulatory agencies and that's just mostly because it hasn't caught up those agencies haven't caught up to um, to include the idea of community biology and so um, and in some ways that can lend to sometimes the thought of well if I'm not viewed as valid, if I'm not viewed as a scientist, then I don't, and I don't fall under these regulations, then I don't need to follow any rules. And that's, that's an overstatement. But, um, but, you know, then, then it's the idea of like, how do we convey, you know what, you can't just throw these out, you know, you, you still have to work in a safe way. Um, and I know, Tessa, you already spoke, but I don't know if you want to mention also, you know, something about what we're doing. I guess the, the part of it that I'm most excited about is maybe getting to that point where there are, there are protocols that, you know, we as a community have agreed are, are accompanied by really great biosafety and biosecurity practices that then other people can just go and adopt right away. You know that that kind of developing a shared set not only of, of scientific but also of safety protocols is really exciting to me. Yeah, that's been a big big focus of ours as well. Exactly, is to create a repository of protocols that are including safe practices in you know biosecurity and biosafety. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah. I think before I I switch to to Sandra. There's something small I think you'd like, uh, Sarah, you could clarify to our viewers. Uh, you know, people have been wondering about uh, community labs, about open science. As you say, you can easily be an independent researcher. Maybe in one minute, could you try to enlighten more about what does a community lab do and, and, and kind of the work that you're doing at the lab? I can speak to what I, am, I do in my lab because all of these labs have different focuses and um, were started for different reasons. It's a very diverse community that way. But um, my lab is mostly educational. So um, students, high school students, university students can come in and work on projects and learn how to do molecular techniques. And, um, and, and it's, it's pretty rewarding that way. I'm an educator for university and I'm also you know, like an educator at the community lab. And a couple of the, the people who've been coming out um, just got accepted to medical school and, you know, and it's really nice to, to be able to provide some research experience to these, even high school students. There's one high school student that has been coming out for three years to the lab and to have that on a resume, you know, for an application to college that I've already done independent research for three years. Um, I think is an amazing um, opportunity to give to people. Um, but yeah, so we also do some independent, you know, like I said, independent research other than just educational workshops on how do you do this or that technique. And one of the things that my lab was involved in for the pandemic was the creation of an open source COVID test. And um, we've published that on, um, online and we've published it in a journal. So um, uh, community labs are, are getting more recognition, I guess, <laughs> um, but we have a long way to go and, and implementing proper biosafety and biosecurity into our programs is, is going to go a long way, I think, towards um, people accepting the independent biology. That's, that's so uh, delightful. And I think uh, most of the people now try to pick the past. We know we, these are labs that are coming up, community labs. And, and this is kind of also, I can say, new field because these are labs where people can easily access information. They can access materials to do from the small, simple research up to any type of research that is like 
cut out. So it has been good that you have tried uh, to enlighten us more about it and how you're going out with the safety, coming out with protocols, uh, which is a big aspect to make sure uh, this uh, uh, a good lab could uh, could not stand without such protocols. So coming up with protocols on safety, it's, it's so important and, and, and to, it is going to help this community stand out as, as, as big labs, as labs that can be recognized and do all kinds of research. So thank you so much. Uh, switching to Santra, uh, we had uh, Santra talking about uh, projects that are being done by uh, uh, Symbio Africa. And uh, coming from uh, a perspective that this is an organization whereby uh, it is carrying out a multiple kind of projects uh, in this field. So Sandra, maybe you could go much to enlighten us about the project that is uh, uh, handling this part of bicep and biosecurity and what are the things that are being put in place to uh, be carried out in this project to enlighten the, 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 uh, the, the people that have attended this uh, workshop more about my, the, the much work that has been done by uh, Simbaya Africa. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Erikan, uh, for that um, for the, for this opportunity. And uh, I would like to appreciate uh, the first uh, the, the the just the past speakers and um, the elaborate discussion about the different initiatives that uh, CDC Africa has been uh, putting in place to ensure that uh, there is, um, you know, uh, biosafety and biosecurity is properly implemented on the African continent. Uh, back to uh, Synbio Africa and uh, the project that we are implementing in this space. So um, I talked about the Global Catastrophic uh, bio -risk, uh, Biological Risks Initiative. This is a very, very new initiative that um, uh, Synbio Africa just started out. And uh, the focus of this is um, with all the efforts that are already existent in place, like what uh, Dr. Tokmo talked, ab uh, talked about, as Synbio Africa would like to, through this, uh, through this initiative, would like to enhance the, um, um, the observation of biosafety and biosecurity in the different uh, in the different, uh, um, among the different uh, stakeholders. And uh, so much so um, as a community of synthetic biology, because as you had uh, properly, some of the, the, existing, um, the existing strategies in place may not be fully encompassing of the new things that may be upcoming. And uh, synthetic biology initiatives um, there are so many community labs, as Sarah has just been talking about it, that are coming up on the continent. And there is a lot that is going on in the community that may not be the conventional labs that we have always known about. And so as uh, the people who are um, very much in this space and very much aware of what this could mean, if not properly handled, we are um, starting with um, awareness. And uh, very soon we are implementing some projects, uh, some workshops where we are going to be um, creating awareness on what uh, global catastrophic um, biological risks are among the different stakeholders across the African continent. And then uh, subsequently, we, we would be also discussing on the existing uh, like legal frameworks and see um, what is being put in place? Is it going um, to encompass the different upcoming initiatives uh, like the community labs that we are talking about? And so we are really, really so excited with uh, the efforts of the different stakeholders. And uh, we can see that uh, there is a lot of support that is coming in from um, uh, different um, organizations to see that we fully uh, implement this. Uh, this particular project and uh, you know create the impact that we we, we, we look forward to to, to 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 achieving in relation to yes uh, getting what we will look forward to which is um if people are in the labs doing a lot of this work there is a lot of biotechnology work that is going on we are very excited about the products of what comes out of those labs because these are the technologies that are going to support Africa as a continent to address some of the challenges that we have.
but we, we, we are also excited that we are playing in a space where we are contributing towards ensuring that as we harness this, um, these products, as we harness these opportunities, we are not causing more harm that could probably not only uh, be in, um, you know, like that could not, may not only affect Africa as a continent, but the globe as a whole. So um, that is uh, what I can say about this particular project. But also we are very intentional at um, moving this, um, this knowledge about synthetic biology and biosafety and biosecurity to even the lower levels in, in Sometimes we tend to forget that there's a lot of um, uh, inventions that are happening at the lower levels of uh, education, like um, at primary level, at sec moving up projects to even this young, uh, this lower generation of, um, of persons. And we believe if we can start the initiatives right from the bottom of where the young people are, um, are starting to appreciate what science is and these and these different projects we can be able to create um, a, a population that and as we move on that will help us to you know increase the knowledge and have uh, a better implementation of these uh, particular strategies that we are putting in place thank you so much uh, thank you so much. And uh, as we wind out, uh, as we wind up our panel, uh, uh, just maybe uh, we could have uh, uh, a few words uh, from our, our panelists, uh, starting with uh, Sarah, about these field as we've discussed more about by uh, and by security. As we close, uh, as we come to the conclusion of our panel. Maybe you would like to tell us why this part is important as, as you give us your closing remarks from your side. Um, well, from a community biology perspective, why I think this is important is, um, you know, it's, it's lives are at stake and the health of people is at stake, of course. Um, but I also think it's important, I'd just like to say <laughs> maybe, for um, our, the other esteemed panelists that you, you seem to be in positions where maybe you can influence um, change and you can influence infrastructure. Um, I'm not in a position to do that. I, I'm trying <laughs> my hardest, but um, I feel like maybe the two of you are, are in a position to be able to be influential in this way, um, in a way that you could include community biology and encourage it and provide infrastructure, provide, um, you know, ways for maybe even healthcare related products that are being developed in independent labs to go through the, the regulatory system. Um, these are some struggles that I have had with my community lab in developing that COVID test is that um, there doesn't seem to be an infrastructure for open science products to get out into the marketplace in the US. And so um, it's very encouraging to me that maybe you guys could be in influential in, in providing this kind of infrastructure. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for, for that uh, closing remark. Uh, if we can hear from you, Sandra about uh, how this is important from your perspective as you also wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Eric Khan and um, the listeners here and the fellow uh, panelists. I think uh, this has been uh, so insightful. I, I, I talked about the, the, the the, dis the discussion that uh, Dr. Tukmo uh, brought to live here to us about the different uh, strategies that are being put in place on the African continent. I should say that um, as uh, Africa, we, we've come a long way and uh, 
Yes, there is a lot that is being done and there is still more that is uh, supposed to be done. But I'm, I'm very, very um, happy that uh, these discussions are happening. Like we are here, I know there is a lot of other efforts that are uh, you know, happening everywhere else to see that uh, we have, uh, that we have a framework within which some of the works that we are doing can be uh, um, conducted and uh, being on this particular platform and here with uh, Dr. Tokmo, it's, 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 it's an opportunity that, you know, um, we get to learn about the different areas that may probably have to be included in some of the initiatives that we are, you know, that are being uh, implemented. Because sometimes when the different stakeholders are not involved in some of the works, or maybe if the people who are doing the work, like Sarah is talking about the community labs, if we do not come up and speak at the time when some of these uh, frameworks are being put in place, then we are left out. So Sarah was asking whether we, uh, there could be a way of how uh, we influence policy and all that. Um, I think um, the, 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 the efforts, and we are in a place where some of these uh, legal, fr uh, legal frameworks are just being put in place. We are, for example, uh, Simba Africa, we are at a place where we are lobbying for having inclusion of some of these, um, some of these uh, works in place, like regulation for the community labs and all that. So I, I, I truly believe and I'm very hopeful that uh, by the time we have all these um, things in place, we should be at a good place to support the different uh, people doing the work in whatever level of lab to do the work under proper regulation and policies. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thanks so much for inviting us to be on this panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, we appreciate uh, the talk, uh, Sandra, Dr. Tokmo, Sarah, for this privilege that you have come to talk to us about this important uh, uh, sector of biosafety and biosecurity. So I'd like to welcome questions from the audience um, about a uh, few questions, like in two to three minutes, if you have any question for our panelists, uh, the questions are welcome. Uh, you can raise your hand and we shall be able to take up uh, the question. Uh, I can see Patrick. Uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, thanks. thanks for the opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm, I came in late. I had a meeting, so I don't know if my question has been answered already, but forgive me. So my question is to uh, Dr. Tokmo, the African um, Biosafety, the African CDC, sorry. So what is Africa CDC doing to strengthen the, um, the country-specific biosafety? So African CDC is really big. We are making all the policies up there. How does that trickle down to the individual countries? I'm asking this because during the, this recent pandemic, first of all, I'm a biosafety officer here at the uh, University of Chicago, and I'm originally from Ghana. So I had to reach out back home and we we're having a discussion with the people who were in charge. And there were issues about sample collection has to be done at BLS3. So that led to a whole backlog because there are only two BLSL threes in Ghana. Meanwhile, the reality is this could have been done in BLSL too, and that could have um, sped up the processing of samples and that would increase the contact tracing and all that. How are we strengthening these country specific um, biosafety offices so they can take up these challenges instead of like doing those things at the upper level like African CDC? So, uh... Patrick, sorry, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, Dr. Tokmo had to, to run off for another quick meeting, but I think uh, the question is so pertinent. So what we're going to do is that we, we're going to link uh, you with Dr. Tokmo to see how you can further engage and communicate what is uh, this kind of, uh, of information because he's really approachable and you can discuss more about uh, all concerns of by safety, all concerns of what Africa CDC is doing. So he just ran off, I think, like five minutes for another quick meeting. So we're going to link you so that you can have uh, this communication uh, going on more, uh, more and more. 
Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. So uh, we still have a minute for uh, questions and a question from the audience to our panelists is welcome to Sandra and Sarah. Well, if, if no one is asking, let me jump in here quickly. A question to Sarah. So I'm here in Chicago and like you said, you have this uh, community-based um, lab where students come in. So what, what is the level of um, research that you allow in your lab? Do you say just DSL2 or anyone can come in with any research they are doing? We have only worked with BSL1, um, but um, I have, have two labs, so and they're adjacent. So one is a community lab and the other is a, a private lab. But um, in the when I'm there, it's everybody can just use all of the equipment. So the, the private lab is biosafety level two but we've only worked with biosafety level one. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think uh, if we do not have uh, any question from uh, the audience, let me check in the chat and, and see if there could be any question. I think there is none in the chat. Uh, I think there is none uh, of the questions that chat. So uh, thank you so much again. A vote to, of thanks to our panelists, uh, Dr. Tok Maruta in his absence, Sarah and Sandra for honoring our invitation, uh, our invitation to come and present uh, on this workshop. It, uh, we're really humbled and I think uh, this, uh, the people that have attended have gained a lot from this and I know more interactions and information will be coming in as you link with most of the people via social media, via LinkedIn, via Twitter to discuss more about uh, this topic of biosafety and biosecurity. So I'd like to hand back to the moderate, uh, the moderate of the entire session, Alex, uh, to get us to the next as we conclude uh, this workshop. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, uh, great discussion. Uh, there uh, from the speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah, uh, for you for uh, clarifying on how uh, your community lab is, is doing. Thank you, Sandra, for everything, and uh, Dr. Tokmo, who has uh, who has who has left already. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, for for the question and all the others who have been involved uh, in the discussion uh, in terms of questions. Uh, great appreciation to uh, Tessa. Uh, who gave us a great presentation during the workshop. Uh, thanks to Geoffrey and all the others that have been able to uh, put uh, resources in the chat. Uh, your work has been really so much appreciated. And to all the attendees, thank you so much. Uh, it's been really a pleasure. Before we um, leave uh, Gameli Ajaho to conclude and make final and closing remarks. Over to you, Gameli. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, there, there's a lot of things going around, so I'll continue in that fashion. Uh, just to say big thanks to our two Jogal African ambassadors, um, Alex and Eric, for the fantastic job they've done. I think that they've put together a very great uh, program I'd like to say thank you again to all our speakers and panelists for their contributions and to the participants for making time to be with us. Um, I had a, a small presentation to share about Jogo and what we do and why you must join us. But uh, I think we've run out of time, so I, I won't make the presentation. However, I'm dropping the link to our Jogo Africa community in the chat. So feel free to um, click on it and sign up to Jogo if you want and, and join us there. We have um, events on different topics uh, uh, pertaining to community science and innovation. And so in the future, uh, we'll be running more sessions like this. So please check them out and join us um, as and when it meets your interest. And um, if you are able to, um, the next event that would we'll organize uh, next month will be focused on digital fabrication. 
And so if that's your kind of thing, uh, feel free to join us. Um, we are also organizing the Just One Giant Summit. Um, the registration is already out. We can send it to you through um, your, your emails or after, um, like uh, through the meetup, um, which uh, we have a panel or we have a, set, a track on biosafety and biosecurity uh, led by Erican. So um, you can check that out and uh, interface more with this topic. Geoffrey from Simba Africa. Simba Africa have been great uh, partners for Juggle Africa. We've had a lot of interesting collaborations so far. And so um, uh, he's also shared information on um, more training coming up uh, for professionals in different parts of Africa um, uh, to get more into this topic. And so feel free to send him an email. Um, he's, he put his email, gotim at simbaafrica.com, feel free. And if you want to reach out to Jogol Africa, also feel free to email us, africa at jogol.io. Um, so I'll just say thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, please turn on your cameras so we can take a group photo. Uh, before we leave. Otherwise, um, yeah, thank you and have a, a nice day.